look at uh, self-determination theory, which is probably the best accepted psychological theory on human motivation, talks about three key drivers, autonomy, mastery, and purpose or connectedness. Mastery is the innate human desire to improve ourselves and our circumstances and our surroundings. Sometimes when you play a game, you just want to like distract yourself. Sometimes when you play a game, you want to get better at connecting with other people because you're lonely. So one of the most useful ways to say, I want to learn from games. I want to learn how to drive retention and engagement and, you know, people getting closer to flow is to really think about as a user, as a player of games, but also as a creator of anything. Really think about what is it people are getting better at and how can I support that? And it's that journey that connects great games and great products, that customer journey. Hey everyone, thanks for watching this episode. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure you like and comment below. And to find future episodes in your feed and push notifications, make sure you subscribe. And if you click the little bell, you'll get every new episode as it's released. Thanks again for watching. Today I'm sitting down with Amy Jo Kim. Amy Jo is a social game designer, entrepreneur, startup coach, and author. She holds a PhD in behavioral neuroscience from the University of Washington and a bachelor's degree in experimental psychology. She has taught game thinking at Stanford University, and she was an adjunct professor of game design at the USC School of Cinematic Arts. Amy Jo has been named by Fortune as one of the top 10 influential women in games. Her design credits include Rock Band, The Sims, eBay, Netflix, Ultima Online, Indiegogo, and many, many, many more. She is widely known for her books, Community Building on the Web and Game Thinking. Amy Jo pioneered the idea of applying game design to digital services like social networks and more years before the terms gamification or game mechanics were introduced in 2010. Today, she runs the Game Thinking Academy where she works with and trains entrepreneurs and game product teams around the world. In today's conversation, we discuss how game design has been implemented into the user interfaces and the user experiences of some of the world's most popular consumer internet brands. So with that said, Let's dive in with the one and only Amy Jo Kim. Hey guys, I'm gonna take a quick pause to introduce the first sponsor on The Jay Gould Show. I am happy and proud to say that this show is now sponsored by Witham Smith & Brown, which is a forward-thinking, technology-driven advisory and accounting firm that is committed to helping big and small companies be more profitable, efficient, and productive in today's complex business environment. Witham now also has a dedicated crypto and blockchain technology team to help early stage businesses properly navigate all the crypto tax related matters. I've been using Witham both personally and professionally for nearly a decade for all of my businesses' personal needs as well. I'm very happy with them and I highly recommend Witham. You can contact Witham by visiting their website at witham.com. Now back to the show. I just want to thank you so much for coming on the show, spending your time with us today and give us some insights into your thinking. Absolutely. Let's dive in. So you are an amazing resource for entrepreneurs um, on product market fit, which I saw recently you did a talk with Gary. I thought it was great um, where you talk about <laughs> yeah, uh, where you talk about uh, the game thinking in your book and all that kind of stuff. I've looked at some of your work that's earlier, which we just talked about pre-call. Uh, I just wanted to dive into who you are first before we dive into that work. So if you want to just give us a little bit about yourself, your background, and what led you to what you do today. I'm a game and product designer by background, and I am a startup and team coach by what I do today with my partner and team at the Game Thinking Academy. I, um, my background's in psychology, neuroscience, and computer science, and I worked in tech for many years as a software engineer and a UX designer, and then a product designer and producer. So my, that's where my background is. And I had the um, luck and pleasure to get to work on a string of breakthrough innovative hits like Rock Band and The Sims and Covet Fashion and Netflix and eBay and a few others. But I've also worked on dozens and dozens of projects that weren't hits, many of which you've never heard of. So. Um, 
over the years, I've been able to synthesize what I've learned from that into practices and techniques and tools, which is um, summarized in our book, Game Thinking, and is what we uh, use to uh, help teams 10x their product market fit in a very quick amount of time. A lot of it are lessons drawn from the gaming industry, but also from working on hits like eBay and Netflix that weren't gaming, but were, you know, marketplaces. And so um, where we're focused on is how you can innovate smarter and faster and how you can build lasting retention into uh, experiences, whether it's a game or a marketplace or a product. And it's really that intersection of innovation with um, retention and sustainability where we sit today and where we help our clients, which range from game studios to very large companies working on cutting edge innovation to small startups and entrepreneurs all over the world, you know, bringing new ideas to life. In your book, Game Thinking, you actually wrote, um, game designers don't design badges and point systems, right? They de- That's not the heart of what we do. We build systems that teach you themselves. We build systems that enable people to do things that they didn't think they could do, whether that's driving a race car, uh, scoring a goal in the world se- in the World Cup, or blasting an alien monster in the face. Right? Uh, you build systems that unveil possibilities, points, and badges, and the rest are just markers along the way. But it's not the goal. Uh, and then for the call, we jumped on. We talked about this as well a little bit. Um, those types of things that you build, the badges and all these markers and things like that, is is there some element there that just creates addictive behavior from like a dopamine perspective? But the other stuff that we, I want to talk about is, you know, where you're no. building things that no, okay, it's a myth. Um, when you see a game or a product that's got points and badges that are working, that are actually creating or co-creating something addictive. It's not because of the points and badges. It's because there's a strong experience there, often with some sort of progressive missions or some sort of progressive activity that you can get better at over time. If you don't have that, all the points and badges in the world won't create anything addictive. They'll end up being annoying and cluttering things up. And I have dozens and dozens of companies I've worked with who come to me because they bought the myth that points and badges work, maybe throw on a leaderboard there, and there's no interesting experience at the heart of it, and they're not quite sure why they just wasted a lot of money. And they're not quite sure why when they added points and badges, they got that short-term lift in their stats, because it often does, but it in fact backfired and made their retention even worse. What I just described is very common. I bet some of you listening have seen this happen or had it happen. I've had it happen. I didn't start off as an expert. I stumbled and made a lot of mistakes along the way. But the um, the visible mechanics, points and badges, they're a tiny tip of the iceberg. Um, often, the way they're much more effective is hidden under the sheets and then interesting things happening at the surface. One of the biggest uh, misunderstandings of gamification of that whole um, wave was that that's where the power and the magic and the stickiness is, and it's not. In other words, if you have a beautifully designed UX, but a product that's not useful, it doesn't matter if the UX is well designed. You know, and I've seen a lot of very useful products that sucked in their UX, but they were so useful, people made their way and they used them. So it's similar with games and game mechanics. And what I've learned myself since the time that um, you first discovered my work is that although many social products have visible mechanics, follower counts in Twitter, likes in Facebooks, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Those are there and they're markers, but lots and lots of social networks have launched with those that never took off. That's not where the magic is. That's not, it's, those are game mechanics and similar to UX widgets. If you're a UX designer or product designer, 
You don't just like take a UX widget that worked well in some app and stick it in your app. It has to map to what the customer is trying to do and the progress they're trying to make. A great experience is going to help your customer make progress at something they care about, whether it's a game, whether it's Duolingo, whether it's just Snapchat, whether it's TikTok, whatever. And making progress is defined completely uniquely for each product. It's very different in World of Warcraft than in TikTok. But it's there. It means that as you invest more into the product, you get something more out of it whatever is meaningful to you. In TikTok, the algorithm gets better. It's serving you up stuff, right? It's all that magic's happening behind the scenes. So the important thing to understand about game mechanics, it's not that they're wrong or right. It's that that's not where you start to design a great experience. To design an addictive or compelling experience that's sustainable, you need to really think about who your customer is and what they want to get better at and craft out, at least in uh, conceptually, a journey that they can go on and the systems needed to take them on that journey. And then you build little pieces of it to get started. The mechanics support the journey. They aren't the journey themselves. Yeah. And you say this in the book, you say it's about creating value, real value, not using parasitic means of extracting revenue out of through all these. Right. And the mechanics can bring the value to life. Duolingo is a great example of that. Yes, exactly. Snapchat, YouTube, TikTok, there's like all these elements that's part of the experience of what you're doing. And then it's reinforcing what you're doing, I guess. Right. You know, you also said, um, you designed to elicit that caring, that emotional attachment. Successful games have something in common. I thought this is really interesting. The intrinsic joy of skill building, which I think you're alluding to here. Um, It feels good to engage our brains, improve our skills, and make progress along a path toward mastery. Games, sports, education are particularly good at laying out this path, but every product leader can learn to harness the underlying power of skill building and challenge. If the level of challenge increases to match your evolving skill, you get a step, you get a setup for flow and the ultimate goal of every game and product designer. And then on page 13 in your book, you show the flow diagram, which I think is really interesting. So could you maybe just describe what you're talking about here? Flow is when your skill and your um, ability is balanced. And as your ability goes up, you need to have uh, greater challenges to keep you at the edge of your skill. That's what flow is. It's a really well-known concept. You can read about it in a book by uh, Mikhail Chizinitsky. Um, not every product puts you into flow while you're using it. And you will never get thro- flow just by throwing points of badges at something because flow has to do with increasing challenge over time. But it can be very simple. You know, I watched my daughter use Snapchat, for instance, and it's changed over time. She's 15. She's really good at it. Part of her flow with it is she's configured it how she wants it to be. And it took her a while to get there. So um, some games and sports really do sort of ratchet up skill as you get, you know, makes things harder as you get better. But um, on the broader level, if you think about skill building as some as a core human motivation, which it is, um, you know, there's really if you look at uh, self determination theory, which is probably the best accepted psychological theory on human motivation, talks about three key drivers: autonomy, mastery, and purpose or connectedness. And mastery is or competence, as it's sometimes called is the innate human desire to improve ourselves and our circumstances and our surrounding. We like to get better at stuff. We like to better ourselves, et cetera. That can take lots of different forms. But anytime you're building a product or you're experiencing a product of any kind, like a digital product or a SaaS product or a social product or a new game, It's really interesting to say, okay, let's say that I engage with this for a week or 30 days or three months. What is it that I would actually get better at? Sometimes people get better at the product itself. Like imagine using Slack. That's a great example. 
a lot of us learned how to use Slack, especially, you know, used it more during the um, pandemic. And when you're learning how to use Slack, you have to learn, you know, the, you learn about the bot commands and there's various things you do. And then there's emojis and, oh, look, you can customize your interface. That's learning the tool. But what you're, what are you really getting better at when you're using Slack? You're getting better at collaborating with your team and with your workmates. And if Slack didn't deliver on that, nothing else would matter. And in fact, when it doesn't, people stop using it. So often people want to get better at something in their real lives. Sometimes when you play a game, you just want to like distract yourself. Sometimes when you play a game, you want to get better at connecting with other people because you're lonely. There's a lot of different things people get better at when they play games or when they use a product. So one of the most useful ways to say, I want to learn from games. I want to learn how to drive retention and engagement and, you know, people getting closer to flow is to really think about as a user, as a player of games, but also as a creator of anything, really think about what is it people are getting better at and how can I support that? And it's that journey that connects great games and great products that customer journey. So I told you I ran across some of your work back in 06 when I was running bolt.com, which at the time was the number one visited video sharing site before YouTube beat us. Um, you had provided some very interesting insights from the gaming world that could be applied to most online communities and some stuff that I read um, at the time to create better user experiences, loyalty within the online communities that we were building. We had tens of millions of users on Bolt and we were trying to increase adoption and retention. And back then you stated that games trigger the most primal response patterns and depending on schedules of reinforcement will produce varied results. At the time you listed what you called game mechanic elements. These were community collection, point systems, feedback, personalization. Um, I later wrote a blog post that, that Jeremy Liu from Lightspeed Gent Ventures had uh, written back and forth. We actually became friends because of that, um, inciting your work. Um, and I included two more things uh, in, t in addition to those things uh, in my little framework test. And, I, and by the way, I did this for vetting new ideas that I was either going to invest in or potentially build, right? And uh, I added competition and tipping point, right? Um, I've invested in over 80 startups in the last 10 years. Uh, and when I evaluate deals, I have this thing I call TTT DSD, team traction, TAM, differentiation, scalability, defensibility. When I go into the scalability and defensibility part, I go back to your game mechanics stuff that you mentioned 15 plus years ago. Um, now I've mentioned this to people many times on Twitter, on clubhouse, Twitter spaces, clubhouse, to drop an audio app. I talk about it on my podcast a bunch. But I've never actually gone down the rabbit hole and we talked about what the game mechanics are. I've kind of talked at a very high level um, of what those two. And I know that we're not talking about the game mechanics of the actual visuals and audible and all this kind of stuff. I'm talking about the functionalities that within the product that makes it, makes it addictive to the users. And of course, these are some of the vanity things that you we can see on the surface, right? Um, I would like to walk through some of the stuff that you talked about previously, if you don't mind. Um, you know, the first thing would be competition, which is the one that I added, by the way. So this is barrier to entry. This is threat of substitute. This is first mover effect or differentiation, right? And so you have to be different, I think, if you're going to have an idea, right? It's got to be different. Otherwise, what's the point, right? Once you get past this, right, then it's about building a community because you've said that community is essential to building addictive, sticky online experiences. So when building a community, what is the first number one thing that the developers or the, the the creators should be thinking about when they're building it. And I think you've talked about it in your book, it's the core users, right? The super users. Definitely. But in terms of a community, the most important thing to think about up front is the purpose of the community, because it's relatively easy to pull people together and whip up excitement for a new community, witness the number of new discords, right? For all the crypto and NFT projects. But sustainability is the issue with community it's much, much harder to do something sustainable. So um, what the communities without a clear purpose will often devolve into the lowest common denominator. So purpose is very important. Um, and the thing that's changed in the last few years that's been really fascinating, particularly just this last year with community, 
is the number of people that are building essentially community first games. So if you're a product creator or you're a game creator, if you want to build something new, for many, many years I've advocated and helped my clients create early adopter communities, which could then serve as kind of leading up to beta, helping them validate and vet their ideas, getting your first wave of evangelists in place, et cetera. Those are all reasons that early adopter pre-launch communities are so smart to build. And people that build them usually do better than others, but it takes a lot of effort. Um, What we're seeing now, especially in crypto with those projects because of the dynamics of the ecosystem, are is this idea that before you even create a product project, see if you can pull together a community and then even go so far as to have the community co-create the project. Now, if you have a strong core team and architecture, co-creating the project can be giving you lots of feedback. Some people, I think, have this idea now that you don't actually need a strong central team, that if you somehow pull together a community, they can literally co-create a, you know, a well-structured and really interesting project just by the community itself, the sort of pure distributed model or the distributed maximalist. And we'll all see how that plays out over the next few years. But I think that for community building, um, what used to be this kind of niche tool that, you know, the best game developers would use and the best product developers would use, sometimes people would stumble into it, is now something that's um, very aspirational for a lot of people, which is let's spin up a community and, you know, float a coin or an NFT project or whatever it is, and let's get it going. And so I think the issue there is what is the purpose? And the reason I emphasize purpose, of course, who you're targeting is important. There's, of course, identity is important. There's all kinds of things that are important. But the thing about purpose is it's so fundamental that it'll trump everything else. For instance, if you have a a community comes together for a purpose, say to buy the constitution, that was in the news recently, and they don't achieve it, then what? Right? It's like, then there's infighting and figuring it out and, you know, let's, and it just turns into speculation. Well, hey, the coin's going up, so who cares? But that is, that really makes my point about how important purpose is. So I think, you know, my advice to everyone joining a community, starting a community, wanting to know how to make a community sustainable is that if you can get clear about the purpose and you can create a purpose that is real and that is something larger than any one person that people can be part of, that's a great place to be. Um, but it's really important to understand that if you don't, if your purpose is bullshit, if you say it's the purpose, but people can tell from your actions it's not. If you say something is a purpose and you make promises and you don't do them, if you even say, oh, let's just get together, community's awesome. If you don't have a clear purpose, other people with an agenda will take over your community and they will have a purpose. There will always be a purpose. It just might not be the one you intend if you're not careful about it. So going back to the company that I had 15 years ago, video sharing site, the purpose was upload video, share content, right? Or watch video, depending on what side of the, where you're at. Um, so we, we didn't do a very good job of building a very good community though. So we had all these people coming in, uploading it to, as a repository for, for, for video. And then all the creators would come because the viewers were there and the viewers would come because the creators are there. So a perpetual kind of feedback loop, right? Um, but we lost because I think we, they out executed us at YouTube. They had a better design, better UI. Uh, they had better infrastructure. They were never down. Their downtime was like pretty much zero. Um, and then they had a tipping point, right? That was the key. They had this 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 video that got uploaded, <laughs> uh, Lazy Sunday from SNL skit. And that was like, th- that's what they needed, right? One of us had to get some kind of a, a surge, right? And they got this surge. It was all over like the news. It was everywhere. Six o'clock news, 10 o'clock news for like days. 
and that was their surge, right? And then, but because they had better design and they had better they had better aspects of their product, it, it, it obviously continues to flourish. Um, and that's why today it's a five hundred billion dollar company. <laughs> um, but there were certain key elements within the products that I don't even think they knew or we knew at the time. Like we were just building these things, but there was like the and I remember this article. It was like collection is one of these things, right? Um, people are collecting through liking and favoriting and uh, uh, you know creating playlists and and this is you you said something about and it's very interesting. I don't think most users of the products realize that they are the product and that there's human psychology here um that is innate in their dna almost right it's uh inherent in uh, human traits within our uh thousands of years right um that we've been collecting things and that's why they have these types of uh activities on these websites can you kind of just walk through that a little bit again and also just thinking about the nft craze the metaverse and everything with crypto and maybe even bitcoin like how will that relate as well so I really learned the power of collecting back when I worked with eBay, which was very early on. And I saw it because eBay was a platform really for collectors. And that's how it started. Um, collecting is a very human impulse. And some people identify as collectors. They'll say, yes, I'm a collector, right? I collect, you know, old wine bottles or Beanie Babies or you know, weird broken machines at garage sales or whatever. Now, a lot of people will say, well, I'm not a collector and they won't identify as a collector. But if you look at human motivation, there are um, circuits that are built into how we work, where if you, for instance, give somebody five slots and you show them three are filled in. And if they just do a few more things, they'll fill in the last two and something might happen there. It's very hard to resist that. You know, all of us who have ever had those little punch cards where you get a, you know, a free yogurt or sandwich, right? That's another form. That's a spin on it. But um, again, those, let me be clear. That punch card, if you don't like the sandwiches, you're not going to go back even if there's a punch card. So the underlying quality and value always is the most important. That said, um, collecting is one of those human urges that both games and all kinds of products have leveraged and taken advantage. So um, there are, you know, ex there are different uh, dynamics of collecting. If you just say likes is collecting. There's no limit on that, right? You're just, at that point, it's like, if you can like stuff and likes are unlimited and likes are unlimited, that's actually an easy way to just, rem to get the, to not have to save links. It almost becomes, I want to remember that. Well, if I like it, I can easily find it again. For instance, that's how I do likes on TikTok specifically. But on YouTube, you can also not just like something. You can add it to a playlist and now you're like categorizing, right? And, and um, collecting is very powerful. As a designer, um, you just throwing collecting mechanics at something just like throwing points and badges isn't going to get you a great experience. I've seen that firsthand. It's a, it's a technique that you have to use within an overall experience to make sense. But that said, what's really fun to do, and if you're into crypto, you can think about it. If you're just into, you know, watching videos on YouTube or on TikTok or anything you do in your daily life, you know, if you're looking at all the discords you've joined, if you start squinting your eyes and thinking about what it, what kind of collections you have in your life and what limits those collections have and how they tend to maybe change over time. It, it can, it's a fun way to look at products and just look at engagement and it can really help you manage your life. Like if you're feeling overwhelmed, you might want to say, you know, how many newsletters are showing up in my inbox? That's another kind of collection. Let me give you a really good example that's based on YouTube. Since you talked about video sharing, you did that yourself. So one, um, I've done a lot of user research along with clients of all kinds. And one client I worked with quite a bit is a very large uh, multinational uh, beauty and makeup brand. And 
we looked at how influencers are affecting buying behavior, which of course we know that's a big topic. And so we talked to a bunch of uh, young and middle-aged women who bought this brand's products. And we discovered that they had this fascinating collecting behavior that we then leveraged on our product. And this was their behavior. If you looked at, say, a two-year time frame of whose channels they would subscribe to on YouTube, there's U- Beauty YouTube is like a bunch of channels of women that post about skincare and makeup and blah, blah, blah. Okay? That's Beauty YouTube. There's, you know, Tech YouTube. There's Crypto YouTube. Well, this is Beauty YouTube. And so we talked to women about who they subscribe to, and we found most women had somewhere between five and seven, sometimes up to nine YouTubers who they would follow at any one time, but it would change over time, almost like you would swap out your um, fantasy baseball or fantasy football, you know, set, except we weren't, they weren't playing fantasy makeup. They would just, they would follow one and they say, oh, she kind of sold out. Everything's sponsored. I don't follow her anymore. I'm, I'm over her. I'm into this rising one over here. Or they would dye their hair and then they would want to say, now that I'm blonde, I need some YouTubers who do, how do you do blonde if you've got kind of dark skin? So they would follow YouTubers that kind of mimicked their life. And their interest in them would go up and down, depending if they thought they were sellouts or interesting, but it would stay at approximately the same number. What does that tell us? That tells us that there's a certain amount that you can kind of absorb and follow. It's almost like your squad, right? And it's it's like a collection of channels that you follow that change over time but you, you always kind of have your collection and it's yours and you have agency over it. And if somebody annoys you, boom, you unfollow them. And that's very powerful. But often that slot will then get filled with somebody else. And that is a great example of collecting that that behavior arises from the core mechanics, but it's not built in the mechanics anywhere. It's just an emergent property that makes the point of how much humans love to operate in this kind of framework. You, you, well, you've reminded me of, um, I can't remember, was it Path? What one of the co-founders of Facebook started? Uh, you can only have 150 friends. Was it dumb, based on Dunbar's number, I think it was, right? It, it's similar kind of thing. There's like a certain amount and that's it, right? After that, you, you just don't Right, Path made it people. explicit. This isn't, you don't, that's one of the big insights is often making things explicit is, that, is not the right way. And it's, you know, that's why game design is way harder than product design is product designers are like, oh, look, we have data. Let's show the users the data, right? Let's show them the raw, let's show them the follower count. That's showing people raw data. Good game design is almost never about that. Good game design is combinations of data. It's a delta on the data. It's like rating systems based on raw data that have a lot of complexity, right? Right. That's usually what good game design is, not just sh- showing people raw data. That's not usually very motivating. You then talk about feedback. Um, you say it's highly dependent on community, right? You need the community. Yeah. And you say this is th- th- there needs to be a community in, the or- in order for the element to exist most of the time. You said f- uh, feedback illustrates the user's reputation within the community with their abilities, their knowledge, their popularity, et cetera, et cetera. Things we're talking about, again, got to have a core you know, premise to the business, uh, to the product that people care about, they're passionate about. Uh, but then from there, you increase their satisfaction and addiction through the feedback loop, I guess. So there's different kinds of feedback. Um, if you have a social product, because we can talk about single player products and we can talk about much more social products. If you have a social product, yeah, the a lot of the community, uh, a lot of the feedback loops are going to be around how other people react to what you share or what you do, right? That's one kind of feedback. But if you have any kind of a, a interesting core activity, whether it's a social product or a single player product, you're also going to have feedback that just tells you how well you're doing in the product. For instance, there is a game with very light social, but it's mostly a single player game called Beat Star. It's a rhythm action game. I've been playing that recently. And it's got these amazing feedback loops that really helped me get better at the game. 
So I think there's a really key insight for everybody who uses a product or a game or Slack or whatever, you know, Snapchat, whatever it is, which is we talked about skill building earlier. You brought that up. You cannot get better at something without feedback. You don't need levels and badges to get better at something, but you do need feedback. It's much more fundamental than anything else. So the idea of feedback, it's like action, feedback, action, feedback. The idea of getting feedback is really much, much more core to strong product design than I probably realized 10 or 15 years ago. And it's in the product itself. You have, you know, activity and feedback loops, but social feedback is a particular kind of feedback, right? It's your likes, your whatevers, right? It's it's how people respond to you, not the actions that you do yourself. But the actions you do yourself are also very important to be able to get feedback from the system to know how it's doing. So I think that the real takeaway around feedback, similar to the takeaway with collecting, is that if you want to get better at, at you know, engaging in products, if you want to get better at building communities, focus more on feedback than rewards, especially at first. Most people, it's much easier to focus on rewards. You know, join my community, here's an airdrop. <laughs> That's also feedback, right? But um, that has a lot of uh, issues around sustainability. You know, getting people to show up for free money or free stuff is never a problem. It's what you do with that. It's part of why Groupon failed. And, and I heard you do, you did a great interview of uh, Mark Pincus uh, recently. You just posted a clip that was like a, a shorter version of a longer interview, it looks like you did. Um, but it was a great, great clip where he talks about this a little bit. He talks about retention, growing through retention, not virality. Everybody in the mid 2000s, and I was one of them, was growing through virality. But the problem was, how do you get them to stay, <laughs> right? Um, so he talks about this in your video. So I'll put a link in that in the description. I thought it was a great, great clip. Um, high retention creates internet treasures, as he says, which I thought was a fascinating thing. He talks about the retention percentages. He goes, if you got north of 90%, you have an internet treasure. This is like, forget it, franchise of all time. But even 30%, Twitter and Snapchat, he said 10% Candy Crush, War, World of Warcraft, Words with friends. These are forever franchises as well. If you just get 10% retention on these things. Can you just walk through the importance of retention and and how they accomplish this? And uh, one of the things I want to say too, I've always felt like I followed my intuition. You guys talked about this. Intuition is a really important thing. But when I talk to people that used to work for us that have way better resumes than I ever had as the founder, right? Uh, way smarter people than me. They were very analytical. They're very data-driven. And I was like, I just can't tell you. I can't seem to teach them like what the intuition part was. I, I, I just knew in the beginning. But then it's data-driven from there. But there's also like this intuition part. And that's the most difficult part, I think, for companies. Well, that's skill too. You know, it's intuition, but it's also design skill. Um, so yeah, a lot of our work is centered on how do you, one, build retention from the ground up? How the hell do you do that? What does that mean? What are the techniques that yield that? That's one question. Second question is, how do you fix a leaky bucket? If you've got a leaky bucket, which was what Mark was talking about, how do you fix it? What Mark's, yeah, and sometimes you can't. Sometimes you just have to give up. Sometimes there's no there there, right? And the whole premise doesn't work. And sometimes you that's you find that out and that's often an expensive lesson. But um, so let's take those one after another. The how you build retention from the ground up. I feel like this is something that I learned because I had no idea. And as I look backward on all the projects I worked on, I see there are certain practices that I think probably people stumbled into, right? That yielded retention from the ground up. They're, they don't work every single time. It, it, you'll notice people that shipped hits, that the next thing they do aren't always hits, you know? It's complex, very complex what goes into shipping a hit. Yeah. However, this can certain things reliably increase your odds? Absolutely. So for retention from the ground up, what I learned about that is the most important insight. There's, there's so much to say there, right? 
But here's the most important insight. If you want to build retention from the ground up and you're a product creator, a a community creator, a new Discord, whatever it is, if you start by thinking about re-engagement first and you start by saying, okay, they come back, it's day 21, it's day 30, what's a session like? What do they do? What not, So you don't start with the onboarding and the, hey, this is what we're going to do and get in here and here's some free money. Dang. Like that's all onboarding. It's not that that's just not important, but um, that's not how you build something sustainable. If you want to build something sustainable, you start with, okay, what are the, what is the person going to be getting better at and how do they know they're better at it on day 21, day 30, day 60 than on day one? It doesn't have to be big and in the interface. You just have to be able to tell that story. And then if you can start by prototyping that re-engagement loop and really working on that versus working on your schmancy onboarding, you will much, much, much more likely build engagement. So the way you build engagement from the ground up is you start with a core learning loop. Is this like tutorials on the site, tool tips, things like that when people who no, are using onboarding. websites? So this is not when you come back and they tell you, you you didn't complete some of the steps. That's not it. Re-engagement is you're past onboarding. You know how to use your product. What do you do on day 30 or on day 60 or on day 21? You could, um, I mean, it can be some, for some people it's day seven. It depends. But the, um, there are, we like to talk about analytically four stages of your customer's journey because it helps understand the differences. The first stage is discovery. It's where someone isn't yet a member or they aren't using it yet, but they've heard about it, right? Discovery. We all, discovery, very, very important, very tricky, right? But discovery is an important stage. You need to be able to communicate your value prop to the people that you want to pull in in some way, right? And get their attention. That's discovery. Onboarding is when they're interested, they're open to trying it out, they're learning the ropes. Onboarding can be many sessions or just one session. Sometimes it trickles along, but onboarding is when you're basically learning the ropes and doing the first things you need to do to get value. Then comes habit building. That's what I'm talking about. Habit building is, it's not onboarding. It's not, oh, we're getting you into this thing. That's happened already. They're in it. What are they doing? That's habit building. What are they doing every day? right? What are they doing on day 30, day whatever, once they've learned the ropes? And then mastery, which is the fourth stage, and it's more of a vector than a destination, is, okay, so how do you master this thing? What does that mean? In some situations, mastery might be like where the paywall is, right? Mastery might be stuff beyond the paywall. In other situations, mastery might be you know, when you've got a certain amount of, inv- like a certain amount of collections done. There's a ton of collecting mechanics, for instance, in BeatStar, the mobile game I was telling you about before. And they've got really interesting mastery systems where if you do pretty well in the basics, you sort of unlock this whole new kind of ladder that you can start to climb. So there's all different ways to express mastery. And some of them aren't really obvious like that. But what I'm talking about, and it's something that most people don't even understand or design for, it's, again, think of it as day 21 or day 30. It's re-engagement. It's, okay, you've learned the ropes. Why are you here? What is the thing you're doing most often, day in and day out? What is that thing? That's, and if you tackle that first, early in product development, that's it. That's how you design for engagement. That's how you design for attention. Now, would that solve all of Zynga's problems? No, Zynga has very complex games. But many, many, many games, just like Mark talked about, that fall off on retention don't have a satisfying day 30. They, do, It's just, it feels like work. Is it because the development team just didn't think that far out on their product? Why is no, that I mean, happen? it's complex. For Mark, I mean, a, so a lot of times it's that you just don't prioritize it. So there's never just one reason that that doesn't happen. And that's a rabbit hole we probably can't go down right now. 
there's many, many reasons. But what I can tell you, I work with tons of game teams as well as product teams who struggle with retention. And this is what we do. We kind of strip everything down to why are people here? How is this game different than other things on the market, which is related to why people are there? And what is it they're doing over and over again? And where's the joy in it? Where's the pleasure in it? Where's the satisfaction in it? Where's the, is there curiosity? Is there any kind of narrative overarching that's hooking them in so they think about it between sessions? All those things. There's all those things can be relevant. But um, if you want to build something high retention, using the framework I just laid out and then zooming in on what I call that core learning loop, which is what are people going to be doing on day 21 or 30? And what's the feedback in that experience that helps them know they're getting better at something they care about? And if you can address that, you're like 50% there. There's other factors going, but when I work with people that have terrible retention, Almost always, they've one, never really thought about it. And two, if you map out that experience, it becomes blindingly clear why they have such a leaky bucket. So it's a really useful analytic framework. But you would you would probably agree, right? All of the top internet destinations, they've nailed this, right? They have teams there that are working on all of this. All the Google teams, the Facebook, you know, Snapchat. I mean, everybody in social is working on this stuff, correct? Yeah, they may work on it with, you know, different models, but yeah, they've iterated their way into it. And but they don't always necessarily start that way, right? No, mo- no. Most people, you know, it just it depends. A little bit of lightning in a bottle, get traction and then they figure it out. Well, I mean, there's most people you don't hear about all the things they did that didn't work on the way to the thing that worked. Most people tried a bunch of stuff that didn't work and run experiments and then they finally figure it out. Some people figure it out, but then the business model doesn't work, right? Like there's a lot of different things that can happen. But sometimes like Snapchat had a lot of trouble. They were left for dead several times, right? I'm su- I got to tell you the Snapchat thing really surprises me because there's it's ephemeral. So there is no real true collection at least from the outside, right? There is that number that they give you a score, but Well, the, you have the, your you- collection of friends. I mean, you can collect content, but you can collect people too. There's different things you can collect. And I look at the way my daughter uses Snapchat and she doesn't collect content on Snapchat, but she's kind of got her circles of people and there's like the super close friends. And then there's like this group of girls who doesn't like this one other girl. So she's not in that group. And then there's like, then there's these like circles and those circles are very much like little collections and they're collections in the same sense. I was talking about those YouTube channel collections. They morph over time. Yeah, I just, I, I just, felt, I feel like they're they almost broke the rules a little bit, and it worked. Um, but it was probably just because everybody else was looking at the vanity visual metrics. And to your point, there was they, they had a deeper purpose there, and people were they were engaged in the product for the for the intended use, which is the which is the ephemeral use. You know, and they iterated into success. They figured out how to serve the audience who loves what they're doing, who's very different than say the Instagram audience. My daughter the other day, she's so funny. She says, I'm not on Instagram or Facebook, by the way. Um, I used to be, but I'm on other platforms now. She goes, why aren't you on Instagram, mom? I said, I don't know. I don't really like Instagram. I like TikTok and Snapchat. And she says, you're much too old to be on TikTok and Snapchat. All the old people are on Instagram. Why don't you go join the old people on Instagram? And I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe you said that. Don't let the people at Facebook hear you say that, but it's actually true, right? It's true if you look at the demographics. Yeah. And I'm just saying, I think Snapchat did a good job of uh, listening to the market and following the market by, and also adding vision. You know, my daughter is very comfortable with those messages not being saved. That works for her. I always thought that it has a low barrier to exit, very low barrier to exit. Like you just leave in a heartbeat because you're not leaving anything behind. What are you leaving behind? If something else came along- you know, but but it, it seems to work for them. They're not going anywhere. I'd love to do a deep dive on Snapchat's current architecture because I think it's changed a lot. But I think that they've nailed something that's uh, almost like lightning in a bottle, right? It's hard to put it into words or get your arms around it. 
but they've definitely nailed something. And to your amazing point earlier, part of how they did it was by being different. Yeah, they're very different. Everything they've done, the colors were different too. The color of the internet's blue and they're yellow. I mean, it's like everything about it is different, it seems. It's so important to understand that if you're going after a market where there's a gorilla there, you can't just be a little different. You just can't. No, Gary was saying that in your interview with Gary Tan. He, he said that too, actually. I, I don't know if it was the interview. It was a different one I think I saw on your channel where you had him and two other guys and they were giving their feedback. So like how to... Uh, network effects was one guy I was talking about. And he, he mentioned differentiation, I think, Gary. And absolutely, you have to be different to matter. Right. And you see this a lot, especially with first-time entrepreneurs and first-time game designers. You'll see that they'll say, you know, I played this game a lot and there was this one feature that annoyed me and my big hit is going to be just like this game with this one tweak. And I'm like, no, that's not going to be your big hit. But again, I think you have to learn that through experience or maybe through listening to smart people like you and, you know, your podcast to, to learn. But um, it really is true. And one of the ways that we've developed that helps you test this is you can actually, you know, I keep talking about your 30-day experience, your 21-day experience. You can put together storyboards of people using your product or how you imagine they'll use your product over time, just these like beats of storyboards and run them by your, who you think you're going to be targeting and learn amazing amounts about whether your product makes sense or not before you've coded or designed anything. And it was really discovering that that unlocks so much of this designing for retention. Because when I talk about the 21 day experience, well, how do you create that? How do you think about that? How do you design that? Do you have to code it all up? No, but you have to think about it. And if you can think about it and get it in front of your team and get it in front of people like, you know, discovery through onboarding, through habit building, a touch of mastery, you can find out which of your assumptions are right and which are wrong really early in a project. And that's a lot of where the magic is, is how do you figure stuff out without building it all at building and shipping? And so that's part of it is, you know, you can storyboard it. Another trick going back, calling back to what we said earlier. You can also see if you can pull together a community with your idea. You know, Lean Startup talks about fake landing pages. That's an old trick. That's really a marketing trick. That's testing your marketing. But it's, you know, you want to test your value prop. Can you get X number of people to sign up and maybe want to be part of a community based on a value prop? That's these days, especially in crypto, that's a huge uh, test to see if you'll get funded, to see if you can pull a team together, to see all those things. Before we jump, Amy Joe, I want to ask you about Bitcoin for a second. Um, from the leading expert on game thinking, I would love to hear your thoughts about not just crypto in general, but Bitcoin specifically. Why do you think it has rose to the prominence that it has? Is there any elements within game thinking and game theories and stuff around game mechanics, et cetera, as to why you believe it's gotten to where it's at? Or what do you think the primary reason is to why it's grown to about a trillion dollar market cap these days with, they say about what, 100 million people, et cetera? Is there true community in Bitcoin, by the way? Saying something is a Bitcoin community is meaningless. There are Bitcoin fans, there are Bitcoin holders, but, um, you know, I don't really know. I think, I, I think that um, there are a lot of people that are very frustrated, especially if you look outside of the U.S., a lot of people are very frustrated with their governments, with their, um, you know, with friction, with corruption, with uh, their, you know, native uh, currencies not being stable. There's a lot of frustration. There's a lot of uncertainty worldwide. Um, so I think that uh, that's part of what's driving it. I think the nature of it is that um, because of, you know, let's face it, it is pyramid shaped, meaning you know, the people, the money for the people that get in early comes from the people that get in later, right? And, you know, that doesn't mean it's a pyramid scheme. It means it's pyramid shaped. Many things are pyramid shaped. I'm a game and system designer. I understand how to spot these things. But I think that 
for a lot of people, it's, um, you know, there's definitely the FOMO that's driving it, but there's also really seeing it as a hedge and seeing that the risk reward, you know, worst case, I lose my investment. Best case, I do really well. Um, there's definitely some of the get rich quick MLM stuff that's driving it, but I think it remains to be seen in particular in places. I'm really looking at places like Africa to see how Bitcoin plays out there. I think that um, if we can have, I'm a huge fan of regulation. I don't think this stuff's going to get real until it's regulated. And until Bitcoin, if, unless it's stabilized, it's a speculative asset. It's not a currency. Currencies can't, you know, there's a, one of the things, one of the things about community that's really important to understand is that communities need stability to thrive, but markets and trading needs volatility to thrive. Are you with me? So there's a fundamental tension there and it's important not to close your eyes and pretend you don't see that. So I'm very hopeful that for instance, maybe the PayPal stablecoin and the Square stablecoin and other legit stablecoins will replace Tether. I think the biggest risk to Bitcoin is Tether. Um, Tether makes me very nervous. I will be less nervous and much more bullish when I see um, legitimate and regulated um, things happening in the market. I think that right now, most of what's been driven is there's a lot of FOMO and speculation, and there's definitely some people looking for a community. Whether or not Bitcoin's a community, are there Bitcoin communities that exist? Absolutely. They are run by individuals who took the opportunity to pull something together, who take the initiative to keep it going, to make the, it be about something. But most of the I think for crypto in general and Bitcoin in particular to really emerge as a major worldwide force that we all accept, there will be um, there will need to be a lot more stability because again, communities thrive with stability. So what you see now is so many crypto communities is they're at their core speculative. And that's fine if you want to be a day trader or if you want to have that trader mindset. But there are many, many more people who just want to go about their lives with some sort of stability and they don't want to buy a lottery ticket, right? Which was a lot of what Bitcoin is, is like somebody wants to win big with very little effort. Um, until we get beyond that, it, it it's not going to grow into something that could be a true community because of this, I think, stability issue and it becoming not, you know, it transitioning to something that's truly a means of enabling trade, commerce, et cetera, versus, you know, speculative assets. I got to ask you this follow-up question based on that. Well, what do you think? Uh, well, I don't usually give too many opinions on here, but I, I, would, I would say that I, I don't know that there's a community in Bitcoin, like you said, because it's not an online place in one particular, there's a lot of different sects of uh, Bitcoiners, I would say, right? Uh, people who believe in Bitcoin. Um, generally speaking, I would say, um, I don't know that I agree that it's purely just speculative because, I mean, to some extent it is speculative. I shouldn't say that, but but I do view it as a hedge, like you said, against the hedge of the dollar and inflation. And I don't think that the Federal Reserve can stop. They're stuck at like very low interest rates, probably not zero forever, but they're they're pretty low stuck there. That's just math based on the bond markets and where things are at. Like they just can't go above a certain amount, which seems to be about two to three percent. Because every time they seem to get there in the last several years, markets crash and the Fed responds and prints more money. And that's the bull case for Bitcoin once again, right? Uh, because they can't debase, they can't debase Bitcoin, and there's only 21 million that will ever be created. And as a result of that, number goes up if more demand comes in. And as long as they keep manipulating money supply, it seems to be over time you're going to have more people believing that. But there's no guarantees, right? You don't know what the future holds in terms of the demand moving in over, the, over time. You just know that there's a limited supply over time. So as long as you believe there's increasing demand, there will be a higher price over time, it assumes. Um, but nobody knows. Let, last question. So Facebook changes the name to Meta, right? Uh, clearly going down the space that's going to, you know, the, 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 the Metaverse uh, angle and, and Oculus. Um, were you surprised that they made such a huge shift before they had the traction in that shift? It, it, that seems to surprise me. And then where do you think they're going with this? I'm just curious from your perspective and your, and your expertise. I think that, you know, I think, was I surprised? 
Nah, not particularly. I that seems not that different from other things I've seen. You know, I remember when uh Mark made a decision, I'm sure he had other input, but made a decision about the feed. I remember when the Facebook feed first happened. And that was like now you think, oh, wasn't Facebook always with that integrated feed? No, that was a new feature at one point. And I remember when it happened and there was this huge outcry and Mark was just like, I think it's right. I'll take the risk. Get over yourselves. You know, it was like sort of like that. And so when I look at Meta, I'm like, yeah, that tracks. That doesn't seem that. Sur- I have good friends who work at Facebook. You know, it doesn't seem that surprising. Um, I think that uh, Facebook's approach will evolve. I think that what they showed us is one approach that I'm not all that impressed with, but there's a really lot of smart people there. And I think they will learn like heck and they will evolve and interesting things will happen. But, you know, I was a VP at a metaverse startup like 15 years ago. So that was competing with Second Life. It was called there.com. So I've been through this metaverse a few times and I'm not that bothered with all the hoo-ha about it. I've been on a bunch of panels now and, you know, it'll, it'll subside. Uh, lots of people get excited about Ready Pair One or about William Gibson's vision of a metaverse. And then they slowly figure out that that was, you know, a narrative device, not a spec. So um, I've already figured that out. So I'm not worried. I see other people figuring that out. No, there's not going to be some big, huge integrated thing that makes no sense and that won't happen. You know, and I think all the stuff about portability with NFTs about, you know, your Valorant skin works in Minecraft is complete bullshit, but they'll figure that out. I don't need to argue about it. People in game dev understand how silly that is, but people will figure other things out. And I think, you know, I understand why Facebook's taking that approach because interoperability only happens when one company owns everything. Otherwise, the incentives are just completely misaligned. So or unless you do open source and, you know, all these people are sort of trying to reinvent Web1, which had a lot of open source and interoperability in it. So um, I think that the metaverse is already here in a lot of ways. I think how you define it is as broad as how people define community. Like, how do you define community? Oh, so many different ways, right? I don't want to argue about that. Just like say how you define it and move on. But the, I think the, um, the reality that like, if you take the word out, if you take the word metaverse out and all the hoo-ha around it, the reality is our digital lives are as real as our physical lives. That's the reality. Just look at Zoom backgrounds, right? During the pandemic, People's Zoom backgrounds were kind of a thing, right? That's a digital item. You don't. I'm not saying go make those NFTs. I'm saying we experience the the experiences we have online, whether it's in a game as an avatar, or it's a mixed AR thing, or it's Zoom, or it's Gather Town, or it's any of these things. Those experiences are very real, emotionally, interpersonally, and in every other way. They're real, and the the I wrote this in my book Community Building on the Web, which is two decades ago now. It um, what I wrote at the very end is still true, which is that what's happening is our online and our offline lives are blending. The idea that they're separate is just going away. They're just it's our life, and sometimes we reach out or meet people online, and we may or may not um, ever meet them in person. You know, I've got people on my team I work with every day I've never met. Is that a not a real, you know, experience? Of course not. So I think that the really important insight about the metaverse is that everything about being online is real and that how we present ourselves online in all these different contexts, in Fortnite, in Roblox, in wherever else we are, in Zoom, is important to us. And it's important to us, not just personally, but socially. And so I think why everyone's so excited about the metaverse is because of this collective realization of how emotionally juicy and potentially monetizable 
our online social lives are. And to your point, you've been writing about this, you wrote about this 20 years ago. I just actually breezed through the book. I had 10, 15 years ago when I bought it. Um, you had iVillage in there. We were talking some early internet stuff, right? Um, early, and I was yeah. actually, yeah, I was talking with one of my buddies. He's been in the internet. He, he was the founder of .TV um, with Bill Bill Gross, him and, right? And I was like, I go, look at this. He's talking about iVillage. He goes, iVillage, holy shit. I was on the phone talking about the other day. It was so funny. Um, they were like, Big for a while. Huge. Yeah. That was, I mean, relatively speaking, because of internet audiences being smaller and all that kind of stuff. I was a percentage of internet at that time. Actually, I had Bram Cohen on my inter- on my podcast recently, the founder of BitTorrent. And uh, they had 36% of the internet audience in 2001. Bolt.com only had like 4%. It was like five or six years later. And uh, the amount of users we have, we're not that much different, actually. Just the internet audience got so much bigger. And then when I sold my last company, it was like 40 something percent, but that's an ad network. So they didn't, the difference was, this is what's impressive about what he did with BitTorrent. 36% of the internet decided to download, install, and open up and use his product every day. That is incredible. I mean, I, I cannot tell people, having built businesses like this for 20 years and investing in them, what he built with BitTorrent is just unbelievable. There's not many things. And you had another one the other day on your show with uh, with Mark Pincus. It's very, very, very rare for people to build sticky communities like uh, like what you've worked on and the people you've had on your show. Uh, I wanted to thank you for coming on the show. Where can people find you? Go to GameThinking.io. That's our site. You'll find the Academy. You can connect with me. You can learn about our programs, join our community, get free downloads, all the goodies. Amy Jo Kim, thank you very much for coming on the show. Such a pleasure. What a great conversation. Thanks for having me. Thank you.